felt it felt like you know that MVP Black was going to be the more dominant team here. And then going down 0-2 into E Star, you know, it kind of felt like it was over. You were waiting for the end. The Chen pick kind of came out, and you're like, okay, you know, that was maybe not the best here. Uh, but suddenly, I it, MVP might be able to turn this around. Two drafts in a row that we've been questioning for E Star, though. I mean, to be fair, every Chinese draft has kind of hit a little bit of that flavor, right? Like, I mean, they have that, they have their own style, so much so. That being said, out of all the regions that have their own style, probably the most successful, right? So I, I, I'm not trying to put that in a mocking sense, just that when looking at every draft, you have that big question mark of a pick, right, for the Chinese team. So I, it's just a weird, like, you know, when do you hit that moment where it's like that was the right and that was the wrong, you know, because all of it kind of has that, you know, well, there's the Chinese pick. Just insert, you know, Abathur here, Diablo here, and, uh, you know, or the Chen. Man, we are going to a game number five of this series. Being down and then coming back in this series, MVP Black have all the momentum behind them. It looked maybe like a little less momentum on the faces of E-Star yeah. than their first loss to MVP Black. And, you know, you can't help but think that, of course, they're going to feel that way because they have lost to MVP Black seven times. They just keep getting a varying degrees of closeness. You know, in a best of seven, it was only 4-2. Uh, they've gone 2-1 so many times with MVP Black, but it's gotta be so frustrating to get back to this point when you had such a lead. Yeah, it very much has to be, you know, and that is gonna be our MVP here, Sake of this game. And, you know, I think it's worth it beyond just that huge power play of a Gus at the end uh, and being able to lock down, you know, so many of the assists there for his team. I think just keeping the Abathur at bay, you know, because that could have gotten, if there was no global, that Locust build could have gotten out of control, accelerating the value of each one of the shots on the side of E-Star. Uh, but he, you know, Sake, they're gonna keep it on the lockdown for now. I don't know though, that bolt route. Yeah, that was... <laughs> I need a. I, I wish we got a replay I've of gotta, that. I've got to go back and watch that actually a couple of times because maybe it might be one of those moments where like I was beyond impressed, but like what if I missed like they was revealed at some point beyond just the locust? But if that was just off of a locust, I mean like he's beyond this wall and he blink roots that. He, I, I'm giving it to him, uh, you know Mary Day at least in my heart. You know anytime supports can do flashy stuff like that. I am down. We can actually look at it again. We can? Yeah. We're we, going to bring own? it back up. We've got the power. <laughs> we we've, have, got the we we've got the technology. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we'll begin for that for you guys uh, as soon as possible. But that Okay, is we're ready. Yeah, we we're going to look at it right now. All right. So the skirmish here going to break out. We see Avatar. There is a front gate up still available. Stun comes out. You know, Lucian just pretty much gets pinned against the wall here with the Holy Ground. Not much else to say. Locust should be zoning on mid. And the Gust, man, Sake, look at that. Yeah, this Gust is amazing. So he Sake sees a Locust. put everyone in the corner. We have a Locust on lockdown, so 100% they know that he's going to be there. The front wall, he doesn't show at any point. Seven. Oh, he shows. Oh, okay, he okay. shows. But still, all right. <laughs> so after so was past the wall, but still Merry Day there. I'm giving it to him still. He's still got the spot <laughs> in my heart after that play. So good. Not even necessary. Like at oh. that point, they're gonna win. That's just flash. Exactly. That's pizzazz yeah. for Mary Day. <laughs> it's just just full <laughs> casual route. I just love it, man. <laughs> Every single thing about it. And that MVP Black. They're going to game five. Game five. The winner of this has to go up against L5. The loser will be going down to the lower bracket. We're going to a break, and when we come back, game five. of the store. Prepare for Heroes Brawl, the new game mode that breaks all the rules. 
rated T-13. It's not easy being queen. <laughs> so many subjects to keep in line. So many scores to settle. I am the Swarm. And vengeance has never looked this good. Game five between E Star and MVP Black, and we are headed to Tomb of the Spider Queen. This decides it all, at least for now. This decides who gets to face L5 tomorrow in the winner's finals and who has to fight on for a chance to come back in this tournament later on today. Map pick here for MVP Black. So, you know, going to be the first pick here once again for E Star. I'm trying to figure out if I think this map is going to complement their playstyle a bit more, more than MVPs, and it doesn't feel like that's going to be the case. It does feel like E Star is less of that, you know, like SBT busting out like Zag and concentrating on like, well, we can counter a global as well. We can like that, you know, that split pushing back dooring. And Tomb is going to be such a macro intensive map that. I just don't see it working out. That being said, they could have, you know, their own flavor again, whereas it, nobody's ready for it. Yeah, I think it comes down to can E Star go back to the E Star of old and try to bust out some sort of pick composition. Just go straight for the throat of MVP Black. They do get first pick. This is a battleground that E Star likes too. So it's not like they're down and out in this game. Tassadar and Zarya are very much going to be a hot topic when it comes to the map. Both are huge. Uh, Zarya, not only for control over the turn-ins, not only on kill potential through Expulsion Zone, but then Particle Grenade being able to buy so much time. Uh, it's rather prominent to see her um, on this map. I wouldn't be surprised if it's let through. I don't know. I think that's what Isar is trying to figure out, if they want to ban that and then expect like a Tassadar ban coming out. Either way, I feel like, you know, both of the shielders here, so impactful in the game. Tassadar for his wave clear. And it looks like they're going to avoid either one. Moving to ETC, so does MVP Black try to remove one and let one go over to E-Star or decide, no, we want to for ourselves. They're going to get rid of it. So they'll rid this game of Tass. Zarya available. MVP Black know that if they ban Tass, that it's very likely that E-Star will pick up Zarya. So it can almost be like a if they ban ETC, we know we're ready for that to be the pickup. We have our own plans, probably Vala, trying to take that away too. It's been a story, I think, of this tournament in a lot of ways. I, I'm pretty confident that I think MVP will go into a cooldown direction if they're after this pick. I think they want the Zarya to move into like a mouth cooldown. 
I don't, because Ario's fallen such out of favor across the board. Uh, a raw Gul'dan pick here would be pretty successful for E-Star. And if they deny that, I, I would I actually think it would be a pretty big power play. Yeah, MVP Black have played Ario both times on Tomb. So that is an option for them if they still want to pick it. But Zarya, in the end, chosen once again for E-Star and Tiger. Where do, I, I, I think Gul'dan Mouth, right? I think that's gonna be, I think it's a huge power rotation. Again, you you know, we have seen the last two times MVP Black had played that they moved into the Ariel, but both times the Mouth was removed and MVP has been so prominent in their Malfurion prioritization. Instead, they're gonna move out of all those directions. There just hasn't been a whole lot of Gul'dan this event so yeah, far. Yeah, just, yeah, in general, he is falling out, but I, I thought that Tomb, Tomb would be the place where he would still reside, right? Yeah. Tomb and Braxis, uh, some of the other maps we see him once in a while, like even on shrines and things and such. Either way, they're sticking to the Tyrael and the Ragnaros. More skirmish focus, less when it comes to the, you know, macro play that we see so frequently on Tomb. But, you know, Eastar is going the same direction. They're, you know, not too much in the wave clear department here, at least yet in their draft. That has to be a Volo, right? Or are they trying? That's actually interesting dynamic because they were so confident in getting Jing Chen onto that Vala, but then it didn't work out. So now maybe they're second guessing themselves. Now they it's a, a map, a slot where it fits so consistently and it works with the Zarya, maybe second guessing themselves. It's just so weird in general that they were so quick on the uptake for Muradin and then stopped, completely stopped on this pick. I think a bit of that has to do with the Tyrael that they see on the other side, plus it commits a bit to the four man. Uh, but now they will be struggling in the one with the Ragnaros and that's gonna be the Vala. So Jing Chen there on comfort as well. Where do we move from here? Malfurion's still available. Morales. Morales. Are they trying to force into Ariel? I don't think so. I actually thought that was a stab at Lunara. So Lunara doesn't get picked up more than anything. Okay. Um, so Lunara can't have that high feet positioning while having the healing beam on her at all points and providing the harassment outward uh, that we've seen her in the past. And now it makes, you know, the mouth power play okay, but no longer do we see Lunara as that overly aggressive. So, like, I mean, cause that's the thing is Lunara's health pool is so low that she can't get in range to get trades until like post 16, which again, uh, you never want to bank that late into the game. Gul'dan's being hovered as a ban choice. I don't know how I feel about that. The Gul'dan is very impactful if they move into it and manage to get it even that much later. It would dominate when it comes to the wave clear, but, oh man. I just, I love game five drafts. The yeah. way that they work is, it's gonna be the Gul'dan removed here. All right. Yeah, the drafts get slower and slower, trying to figure out your opponent who can make the right adaptation mid-series to win it all. Malfurion is the first pick, support of choice. Where do we see MVP Black go? What back line do they find the most optimal in this scenario? Are they gonna fall stat again? I see that was my first thought. Gray main's still up, but it doesn't work that great onto the map. It works well with the Tyrael. Uh, but to the map itself, he's not bad. I mean, honestly, I, don't, I would never say Greyman has a bad map, but he, it's not when he thrives. Neither when it comes to some of the off heroes that we see a little bit less in this tournament. No melee assassins necessarily overly dominate. They have the solo, so what complements the four? I think it's going to be the fall set. I think so. No, they go back to the Tychus. Okay. And who is the other backliner here? For now, got to figure our support department. Ariel's still up. Oh, man. It's going to be Savage's hero left. Tiger's the player who plays Zarya. So we've got a support. We've got probably a melee, unless Eastar is going to flex and try to put Savage on Zarya instead. Um, I smell. Oh, man. I mean, you know, let's just take a minute. We'll see where this goes. Support department with mouth removed, with Morales removed. Are you worried about Chen again? No, I am really afraid of Chromie or Sylvanas. And not 
for E-Star, the other way around. No. Where this is about to go, I'm pretty sure that MVP Black has kind of pinpointed E-Star in this draft. What support are they I feel like they're going to take the bait. You think they're going to take Ariel? Wow. Oh. All right. My last that got a little weird uh, with the Alarak lockdown, but it's it, they do have a cleanse on the support, and I think that is huge uh, because that last pick, either one of those heroes, Silva or Chromie, would have been very, very impactful. So now they have to consider the cleanse. They aren't going to have that. Still looking for another backliner. Boss head is an option. Are there any other crazy outliers? I'm trying to figure out if there's a synergy with Tyrael. Greymane still is up. But I feel like I'm missing one. I'm questioning what MVP Black wants to do in this position because Zeratul is still on the board. Generally, MVP Black pairs Zeratul Ragnaros together. They played one solo game with Ragnaros, and in that instance, put on it. yeah, that that's. I think that that was all right. I, I I get the logic, and I I see the process. You know the thought process coming out here for MVP Black, but I can't help but feel like that Zeratul put a lot into you know just the Wombo combo department and getting that pick, it sacrifices a lot when it comes to their four. That being said, it's not like the Alderac matchup is that terrifying. I honestly, I actually, I'm really afraid of the Alderac pick just across the board beyond the fact that it's just a little bit strange. Um, he no longer gets the option to really volunteer into his one, who his lane matchup is. Even if he holds his own into an Alderac, or excuse me, into a Ragnaros, you have the opportunity to sacrifice the Tyrael and just do a power play between a 1-3-1 one, one, because they have two solos on Tomb, just set them and isolate them. Alarak will be into the bottom lane, so then, you know, just really kind of go, am I afraid of him with Ragnaros? Okay, if so, insert Tyrael, because that's the beauty of Tyrael. He just, he's a placeholder when it comes to solos. He doesn't lose them, he doesn't win them. You know, he gets out wave cleared, but he will never really kind of die to those heroes uh, because of his self-sustain. What do you think uh, E-Star's strategy is going to be as far as laning? Are they going to keep with having those solo and then uh, rotate with four? Is there any possibility to have like Zarya and Vala in one? Possibly. Uh, I would say, like, I, originally I'm thinking, like, you know, run a 2 one two. It's China. Like, that. Yeah. this would be a moment to be able to bust that out. But it, it's really kind of not when it comes to their comp. At best, they could run... A 4-1 four, a four standard, but I think what they're going to have to do is baby bottom a little bit more than they expect to with the Alarak. So probably we're going to see, rather than running a four-man clearing between mid and top, is going to be more of like that one-off that goes cycles bottom for a rotation, which is going to just stop the bleeding of the laning rotations. But it's not, it's a very passive uh, position, especially for the early one through seven. And I think that's going to lead to an early turnout on the side of MVP Black. And how important is it? for MVP Black that they're able to get that early turning because they want to get to 10 just as fast as they can, right? Yeah, they, I mean, that is going to be the main goal. I, I don't I don't think it's a must-have, especially considering they have the Ragnaros so they can buy a little bit of time when it comes to the first, you know, turn-in phase. That's true. Uh, but it, it, it will really be able to further their lead if they manage to do so. And Alarak especially when if he falls behind in the early parts of the game and not having very much follow-up CC, because typically that's what you want when you have the all rec is he's not the only one, which is why you see him on BOE, right? Like, you see the circle, you just throw him into it, and it's like, hey, we managed to get the combo. Uh, there's not that much sitting on his team's side or direct synergy that we typically see to get that prep. I'm, I'm really afraid for E-Star in this draft. I, I, I won't say that was as drastic as the Chen, uh, but it's pretty close. Yeah, to recap... Zeratul Ragnaros has been a combo that time and time again, MVP Black have executed. And they did lose once with it for the very first time in the series versus E-Star game number two on Towers of Doom. But it is still something to be feared. It was 7-0 going into the series. And it's not like this draft, like typically when you see this many melee on Tomb, and with that maybe mid-tier of wave clear on the side of MVP Black, you would be concerned. But it, we didn't see any heroes that punish that from E-Star's comp. So it's it's okay, you know? You don't have to really worry about those type of things. So MVP's going to be just fine in that department, you know? I, my biggest concern is their damage output being so much into Tychus and into the combo. But again, without having the sanctification or anything directly to buy time, Ancestral healing is only the only thing to stop the momentum there. And to be honest, it's pretty easy to connect a Void Sulfur Smash onto a Rhaegar and no self-ancestral. China's number one seed 
all the way to game number five. Let's see if they can close out and finally get a victory over MVP Black as we head into Tomb of the Spider Queen. For the last time this series, E Star in blue, MVP Black in red. I do think a lot for E Star comes down to can they punish reset? Tychus's range has been reduced. There is only Malfurion to try to keep him alive. Tyrael shielding a little bit. Can the punishment be there? Well, you know, I think MVP Black already setting, uh, you know, the tempo in this game. <laughs> a step ahead of E Star in the fact that they have infinite more B steps. And we all know that's the strongest indicator of a team's strength level and overall synergy. Oh, absolutely. Once you get those steps on lock, there's nothing you can't achieve as a team. Skirmish, nobody gonna land anything. One thing I do wanna think about that, I, I guess I haven't considered yet. Oh, good root gonna connect there on Lucian, but Jing Chen again with so much damage in him so quickly. You know, MVP Black have been punishing his positioning, and that's something, you know, like, it seems characteristic of, like, you know, the region, his region specifically doesn't really do it that well, but MVP Black, man, he's constantly going from 100 to 0. And speaking of, that's going to be one pick there on to Lucian. Man, uh, the baits on t uh, Lucian so far, to bait him in and then get the root on the backside, getting a kill that early on in Murden. First blood for MVP Black. Again, setting... Setting the tone for this map for them. Yeah, and, uh, but uh, what I was trying to refer a bit to when it comes to the Alderac is that he does better into Tychus than he ever has, just based on the fact that Tychus' range is short enough that it should be easy to get a combo, right? Everybody that Tychus moves into to get damage out play on, Alderac should be in a better position than he would have before this patch. That being said, does that suddenly make Alderac, you know, the go-to? I, I don't think so. Um, we have seen that Alarak is actually keeping him on top. So we talked about, you know, a possible 2-1-2. It's a bit of a different story. It's a 1-2-2. And Alarak in the 1v1 up on top and then just keeping the wave player um, through mid and bottom, keeping that Zarya and Bala together. So not that dominant of landing choices here for E-Star. And BB Black should be able to punish, but so far yet to be able to do so. Well, SW does have a lot of mobility. He can rotate up a lot easier being in that mid lane to help Alarak whenever he is needed, whether he's coming in. And this might be the first gank for E-Star. Nice catch with the totem. Not going to be there in shield time for Tiss. You saw for a moment trying to get that max range. Not going to happen here. One to one in the kills here between E-Star and MVP Black in game five. Gems going to be sitting close to even. Only a couple losses that are on Sake, so a minor advantage here for E-Star. Region master the choice for Tyrio as the primary warrior and on a battleground where it's very easy to make rotations to get globes. He can have that stacked up pretty quickly, but even going into amplified healing at level four, so really trying to make sure that he can fulfill that role of being very tanky so that Malfurion doesn't have to focus as much on Tyrio. Yeah, he's gonna be just, you know, an absolute beefcake when it comes to being a frontliner here. Tist onto that Tyrael now with that build. A lot less damage though, you know, you won't see the cheeky smite kills nearly as frequently as you may uh, with some of the others, but it's gonna be just fine for now. Reset with the flank onto SW, the damage coming up from Kyocha. The nade is gonna push him out of range for the last auto attack on Kyocha. And that means SW is gonna survive. For now, he survives. Tapping as well. Alarak started to move down into the mid too. Kabbalah is there to help clear that up. So both the top laners going back to that top lane, trying to maintain the soak, trying to maintain the pressure as well in the lanes to get a better foothold over these turn-in points as teams get closer and closer to having oh. enough chance. The root was beautiful. Vault comes in, SW blocking, and Xing Chen once again getting punished but making it out. Yeah, at that time, Xing Chen is going to be able to make it out here. I'm so tilted by that nade, I'm going to be honest. 
every time I see it, I see it more frequently than I ever would like to with the Tyrael, or a Tykes, excuse me. If the, especially when there's no ammo, there is no reason to wait, or not wait on your grenade. Wait till they break past the gate and just throw it afterwards because you cannot get the follow up because they break Fog of War. But up until that point, you have all the opportunities to get it. And beyond all else, he just knocked it just out of range to get that kill. And it's, it's that kind of stuff, you know, especially in game number five, that's going to be able to lead a team ahead. You know, the morale, small picks like that, you know, when you're getting ganked and you're like, well, I'm dead. And then you manage to five, you're like, oh, we've got a chance. You know, it, it's keeping the mentality for these teams in here. And you can't risk that. Either way, though, MVP Black still going to have the lead. One to one in the kills, but they do have the first turn in. Drain up on bottom here. Murden is not a good wave clear at all. So this being ammo list and having Web Weaver, this is going to have an absolute heyday. And if they can make something happen elsewhere, MVP Black's going to be just fine. Now the rotation is fairly slow again for E Star and making the defense finally Vala going down to the bottom, but up in the top. That's where the siege is happening with three members. Kyocha diving very deep. Telekinesis misses. And Reset's gonna get taken out. That's a nice win for E Star to be able to get a kill there. Tiger though might go down to 16 gems on him. Kyocha dives in. A one for one. Yeah, and we saw a couple of moments there of the field of heat value and the trade into Kyocha, but with Tiss there and the shields, not enough here. 26 gems do reside though on SW. Level lead for MVP Black as they have got so much pressure here into the map. Yeah, this is uh, a lot to get done with a first turn in phase. A lot of times you're looking at the first web weavers and you're looking at towers. Yeah, in front of like courts, opening four up. towers is a good turn in. Exactly. Uh, two two forts, forts, it's about, uh, yeah, you're looking and you're just like, well, uh, you know, That's the world is ours. And e -Star is going to be grasping for turn ins here. They have a half level window, it's, which is closely, cl quickly closing to get it turned in with those 70 gems they have. And now with 10 picked up, they have no opportunity. That There's not gonna be a turn in for MVP Black for some time, that is the only selling part for E-Star, but they have such a huge amount of time to cl clear pressure on the map that it honestly, it just, MVP Black will get enough gems for another turn in and they have such zone control. Zeratul is very good at getting free scout too when it comes to goaltending. MVP Black, you know, I was criticizing the leaving the mentality of your opponent into the game when it comes to a couple of those picks, but I guarantee a first web weaver phase like that is enough to kind of set you back. Yeah, this is, um, it, it does sort of feel like E Star is grasping, fall, falling apart maybe even a little bit, but there is time for them. They still have keeps at least. They need heroic abilities, they need to get back out, keep these uh, lanes as pushed as they can, and immediately go for a fight when they have the chance. I was questioning the idea of, you know, we see, we talk often about the kind of diversity and craziness that we can see at times out of China. If we would ha ever have the opportunity to even risk moving into, you know, a deadly charge over going with the counter strike, but I just can't see it. You know, I, I can't even see an argument for it, so I'm pretty sure we'll just see the standard in that direction. Yeah, especially with the combo that exists for MVP Black or in a trade yeah. situation too. It's really, really beneficial. Yeah, and so that's gonna be the counter strike here. Reign of Vengeance as well. Bit of a counter momentum. 23 gems turned in 90 though in the hands of E-Star. They have gotten the 10 back. They've gotten, you know, the opportunity to finally fight on the same talent here. Oh, Molten no. Core. Molten Core swing comes out. H is the only, only one who's going to be stunned. He is murdered. Can Dwarf toss away? Sulfira is smashed. Tiger eliminated. And that is going to be another kill and a setback once more. E Star here. The only silver lining is the fact that that was only three gems. They have the gems. They have an opportunity to look to get that turn in. But MVP Black quickly closing in on their turn in there. Not going to connect with the Storm Bolt. If MVP Black gets this They've turn in, it. they are going to get to 13, and they are going to snowball this even harder. With Forts already being gone? I I would honestly just Odin up very quickly. Uh, like, you have so much value with top and bottom. You just look for the Odin, get the pressure out here. But the skirmish is going to happen here mid Counter-Strike. Not gonna land, good jukes there. There's the void. Here comes Sake for the smash, jumps out. Actually, it's still on cooldown, so Sanctification will just be it with Odin, and that is enabling E-Star to all get out, mostly scot-free. Yeah, and the Odin here, the value is gonna get on the Siege. Illusion there, buying time, beautiful route. Twilight Dream for Merry Day. Uh, you know, he has really kind of set his team apart here in this match. Oh. The Sulfurous Smash on the back line is going to get the pick on the Savage. That's 41 gems but they were picked up by Tiger. 
Oh man, Alarak went in, missed the gym, went back in, came out, Sulfurous Smash off cooldown. I was just thinking, oh, this is the second time we've seen Void Prison come out when Sulfurous Smash was oh. on cooldown, but being able to get that zone. kill, Zarya as zone. well. That's 41 gems. Oh my gosh, Lucian goes in, he gets him, no CC. I thought for a minute, I was like, that is just, oh, the worst case. No counter turn it available. E-Star does manage to pick it up here. But that was a nine minute key. Three levels behind. MVP Black's not done. They set their eyes towards top. They're gonna move up. SW, Jing Shen in a tough spot. Reset goes in with the Q. They get the kill. Kyocho with the body blocks here on SW. Expulsion Zone getting the split here. But MVP Black in a five versus four. And this keep sitting so low on HP. They're gonna be able to lock this in. A double keep pre-10. MVP Black is angry about how this series started. Ancestral Healing connects. Kyocha might be in trouble now. This may be at least one kill for E-Star. No, Blink over the wall. Kyocha stays safe. Seven kills to two. E-Star, Lucian at least is gonna basically buy time with it, it, this turn in. Legitimately all he's gonna be able to make happen here. He uh, is gonna buy time, but Usually when you're buying this time, you're like, I'm looking to catch up in talent here, but that is not going to happen. They are so far behind here. Even two turn-ins may not catch them up in talent tiers. That is how big of a lead we see MVP Black here. Beyond all else, the wave clear on the side of Eastar, we've seen is crippled. You know, it, it isn't necessarily the best. And right. they're down two keeps. That catapult pressure as this game moves on, even if somehow miraculously Eastar sets it around, it's just... I, I'm look I can't find a winner where MVP loses this game. Yeah, E Star has a mountain to climb. Even more, if there is something taller than a mountain, E Star must climb it at this point if they want a shot in this series still. It's 16's not achieved yet. This is gonna be the best fight they get. There goes the void. Gonna be dropped down. Odin is used. Oh look at this oh golden core on the retreat the swing. swing is getting the pick. They are not done though, Zing Shen! Savage, everyone is just retreating. Things have just gone from bad to just terrible for E Star. The bomb. <laughs> he just throws out the bomb and then mounts up, walks away. Break the wrist. Drop. Walk away. You know, that is going to be the strategy here. <laughs> oh, man. Now, Wet Weaver is cleared out. You know, MVP Black right now is just sitting there going, well, How do we want to win this game at this point? Boss is an option, but it won't end the game yet. They're going to move towards it. All right, so this is actually the best fight E-Star is going to get this entire game. This is solely based on the fact that MVP Black might get greedy. And that heroic is... abilities are down. At least Void Prism was used, Sank yes. was used. So what you do is you let it move on to the core, and you let it your core actually even take a bit of shields, and you hope to bait. Man, they're going to try and contest this. Uh. No way. Oh my gosh, not like this. Oh, Ancestral connects on Savage. It, it does connect, so Fury Smash not going to have the same fate here. Oh, but that Q value there for Sakai. Feel the heat. It's just blasting through him. They get the kill. So now it's a one for one. And Kyocha blinks out the day there from Tisk. Got the mobility for the team. No, but Holy MVP, ground. that Holy Ground was beautiful. They're just buying time for Kyocha to come around to the side. Xing Chen blown up in an instant. Lucian and SW are the only players left at this point. MVP Black eliminating E-Star one by one. Yeah, the Twilight Dream is really just the icing on top here as the core already has pressure from Catapult. Sanks drop. The core is going to fall. MVP Black goes down 0-2 in this series and hits them with the reverse sweep. Relief on the faces of MVP Black. Not like this, I'm sure, feeling after that second game. Swinging around and getting now a chance at a rematch versus L5 in the winner's finals tomorrow. That will be such an amazing series, but L5 still looks to be untouched. Yeah, I, I mean, especially after the performance here from MVP Black, I think they were pretty consistently considered the second seed going into this tournament. And now, you know, after watching that, I, it just looks like it's going to be the story of L5. It, it would be amazing for L5 to drop a map at this point. And E-Star now falling down. They are not out of it yet. They will face Zero later on today in our final series of the day. But a devastating loss for them. They came so close to finally getting a defeat over MVP Black. Yeah, and you know, if you take a minute to go back and appreciate the small clip of just 
absolute ecstasy that was experienced within the group of players and Jing Chen there. You can, I can only imagine, you know, uh, I, I know he's a very emotional player and I can only imagine the mindset that they must have. But at the same time, I, I think if they were to step back and take an overarching look of the improvement and the difference between the experience of Gold Club World Championship, not only for them as a team, but just for the region as a whole, China has has far better of an argument of a of a you know, almost restoring their performances as what we once knew them to be. Debatably the best region in the world for a small period of time. And I, so I, I hope, at least mentality-wise, and, you know, for the perspective of those players, that they are feeling comfortable. But for now... There is a silver lining for E-Star, and that is because it's double elimination, they very well have a shot at getting revenge on MVP Black. Yes. They have to make it through zero, um, and then the next match from there, and if MVP Black is the team that drops down, if L5 can win that winner's finals, and E-Star looks very good to make it to that third place, second place match, I think that we could see that rematch. Yeah, no, I agree. I think it's very likely that we would see these teams go back to back, you know, um, if you know, it seems like so far the story has held almost exactly as what you would project going into this tournament. And if it's going to hold true again, yes, they will meet up in the losers, losers bracket here. But overall, that was just, I mean, that last game was not even close. It was so convincingly in favor. Like, I mean, the fact that it was a level and a half lead, two fourths after the first turn in. You can't help but it's like sit back. Anytime that happens to you on Tomb, you just got to go watch the replay because you really messed up. Whether it be the draft, whether it be your play, somewhere in there, you made a mistake that was <laughs> colossal. Yeah. Well, now that concludes our winner's bracket for today. Up next, we are going to have an elimination back between Tempest and SPT. We'll see you soon. Right here, constantly keeping eyes on all five members of Misfit. So now that they understand, okay, well, our opponents have eyes on us. Let's just make some plays here. Here comes the Moncore Leila Teal. Big Bolton swings so 